I don't know about you, but there are movie characters and movie lines that get stuck in my head. And I, I can't get rid of them. Um, like this one. Perhaps you remember Tom Hanks as manager Jimmy Dugan in a, world, or a league of their own. When he said, there's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball. Or how about Jim Carrey playing Lloyd Christmas in that very sophisticated comedy, Dumb and Dumber. So you're telling me there's a chance. My sentimental favorite is probably this guy. Bert Lahr as uh, the cowardly lion uh, in The Wizard of Oz. And his one word that has stuck with me through all the years is simply this, courage. Courage. It's the one thing he lacked, but the one thing he desperately wanted more than anything else in life. If you were to make a list of most admired qualities and characteristics of people or individuals, my guess is courage would be right at the top of that list in all times and in all places. Courage is the stuff of legends. It is the inspiration to all people and all cultures. And it is the hope of every underdog and cowardly lion among us. Now, I would just tell you, courage has often been an elusive thing for me. I have struggled with fear all my life. Whether it's the fear of conflict, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, those have been recurring companions for me along the path that I've walked. And I haven't always been real courageous. The dictionary defines courage as a choice or the willingness to confront pain, danger, or uncertainty. I would add another one. Courage is the willingness and the choice to step out in faith when God is calling you to step toward him. See, it's natural to link courage and fear, isn't it? I mean, they're just, they go together, courage and fear. But this morning, I'd like to turn our focus a little bit and draw a link between courage and joy. You might find that surprising, that there is a link between courage and joy. And we've just come through the season of Christmas, where we have talked about a weary world rejoicing, or joy to the world. And, and many of us are in a place in our life right now where we're going, uh, okay, how? Because I'm not feeling a lot of joy. Max Lucado would call that contingent joy. I'd like to talk about the link between courageous faith and joy. So here's my big idea this morning. My big idea is simply this. Courageous faith produces contagious joy. And we learn it from a very unlikely source. A man by the name of Joseph in Matthew chapter 1. If you have a, your Bible, I invite you to turn there with me or you can follow along on the screen as we read the, the, the story. Would you humor me this morning? And let's stretch Christmas just maybe one week longer, okay? Because I think the message of Joseph's role in Advent, in the Advent story, is an incredible and amazing display of courageous faith 
that I believe leads to contagious joy for you and for me. So I invite you to listen to the words of the scripture. And this is a passage you have read so many times, okay? Just pretend you haven't heard it before. Just listen to the story. Let the words wash over you. As this man, Joseph, receives some incredibly devastating news. In Matthew chapter 1, I'm reading in the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. Found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to to divorce her quietly. Now let's just stop there for a second and Soak that in a little bit. Matthew begins this story, this most important story in all of human history, in a really matter-of-fact way. Well, now, the, story, the way Jesus Christ was born, it was as if it, this is just another day in Nazareth. Joseph is probably working in the, his carpentry shop. He's, he, there, he is betrothed to a woman or young girl by the name of Mary. They are in that one-year period where they are betrothed. They are not living together as husband and wife. They haven't had the wedding. It hasn't been consummated. But they are uh, viewed culturally as actually married. So she's living with her parents. He's probably living in the place that he's developing or getting finished uh, the home that he is uh, establishing. He's probably trying to save denarii, you know, for, for this new life together, the and he, uh, he gets this devastating news that his wife, his betrothed Mary, is found to be with child. This morning I want to look at two keys. Two keys to unlocking courageous faith in your life. See, I don't think f- uh, courage is limited to firemen and policemen and people who run into burning buildings. I think every one of us has the capacity to, to live a courageous faith, to step toward God in the face of difficulty. The two keys, the first one has to do with God's power. The second one has to do with God's plan. And so let's look at the first one. And the first one is this. God's power is greater than anything you could ever imagine. God's power is greater than anything you could ever imagine. Joseph has just gotten this news that he is, that his betrothed, his wife, Mary, is found to be with child. Now, that word found is an interesting word. It's it's vague enough to go, well, okay, but how, how did he find out? Now, granted, pregnancies aren't exactly the easiest thing to hide over time. But I, I hope and I think probably Mary came to him and told him what happened. It's possible, though, that there were gossips going around the grapevine in Nazareth in those days and He could have been working one day and overheard a conversation because it it affected him too, you know. His life was going to be, in a sense, destroyed. He was not going to have the cultural standing he would have had had everything gone as planned, as they had planned. But he was, he's told he was a righteous man, a just man, a good man. And so he determined, I'll just... We'll send her away, she can have the baby, she can go on and it'll protect her from the harm that she might experience. But life had dealt Joseph a bitter pill. He must have been thinking, what did I do to deserve this? Because that's what we would have said. What did I do? I didn't do anything wrong. And it was a reasonable assumption that Mary had been unfaithful to him. Reasonable, but wrong. 
reasonable, but wrong. Isn't it true that even in your own life, when things go sideways, when everything turns to mush or worse, that our immediate thought is God can't be in this. He can't be a part of this. How, how, how could God be in the midst of this? And what I would say to you, and I say to myself all the time, men and women, men and women, whether the messes we're in are our own making or they're somebody else's making, guess what? That is fertile ground for the God of the universe to be at work. Because men and women, what the, whatever your circumstances are this morning, they may not be what they seem. They really may not. And if you don't believe me, let me give you two quick biblical examples. One is from Genesis chapter 50, where another man by the name of Joseph, who is the son of Jacob in the Old Testament, is, is, his brothers are jealous of him, and in treachery, they sell him into slavery. He ends up down in, in Egypt, but lo and behold, in the midst of the mess, God raises Joseph up to where he becomes the prime minister of Egypt, and when his brothers come to, to, for food, he confronts them. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 21, you want to put that up on the screen? He says, talking to his brothers, he says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Let that soak in a little bit. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people would be saved. And so he says, so do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Or how about in the New Testament? Paul is sitting in a prison in Rome in Philippians chapter 1. He says, he's in prison. Okay, he's not at the Holiday Inn. And he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me being in prison has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and all the rest here in Rome that my imprisonment is for God. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Whatever your situation in life, whatever your circumstances are this morning, we need to remember that God's power is greater than anything we could ever imagine. And the circumstances we find ourselves in may not be what they seem because I'm convinced that God is at, the wor in, at work in the midst of our, our situations in life and his power is operating behind the scenes in so often that we, we can't see or we can't even imagine. And Joseph was going to find that out very shortly. Let's look at verse 20 in Matthew chapter, back in Matthew chapter 1. He's come up with a plan. He's decided, okay, I'm going to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. There's that word. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, I don't know what Joseph thought at that very moment, but when he heard the words that what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, my gut reaction would have been, yeah, right. Right. That doesn't happen. A line from another movie you probably remember is, that's inconceivable. No, it's actually a miracle. A class A miracle. You see, Genetics 101 teaches us something very interesting. If you're familiar with genetics, humor me, okay? Just be patient. But basically, for a human being to be born, their genetic makeup requires a pair of chromosomes. And there's an X chromosome and there's a Y chromosome. You with me so far? 
The woman always provides the X chromosome, always, okay? The man provides either an X or a Y chromosome. If he provides the X chromosome, you have an two X chromosomes, you have a beautiful baby girl. If the husband provides a Y chromosome, and so you have an X and a Y together in the genetic makeup, you have a bouncing baby boy. Those are the two options. Those are the two options. And we know that Jesus was fully man and fully God, but he was fully man, he was fully human, which ab absolutely means he had an X and a Y chromosome. And the question becomes, where did the Y chromosome come from? And men and women, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That the, the God of the universe created ex nihilo, out of nothing. That's what theologians see, you like Latin, they say, ex nihilo, out of nothing. He created a Y chromosome and he placed it in Mary's womb. And we have the baby Jesus. Now you say, that's miraculous. You know, that, that's unbelievable. But you know what? God created the universe ex nihilo. He created everything that is with a word of his mouth. Boom. He created it all. And so an ex nihilo creation of a Y chromosome is not a big lift for God. Why? Because God's power is greater than anything we could ever imagine. It is greater than anything we could ever imagine. So whatever your circumstances are, you've got to remember that God's not limited by our limitations. What we think is impossible is not for God. Now please don't, please understand me. I'm not anti-science, I'm not. I believe the scriptures are replete with encouragement for us to study and learn and understand all aspects of science and nature and, and the world we live in. But humility demands that we, that we must realize that we are not at the apex of, of knowledge. I mean, we are not at the place where we have nothing more to learn. We are just scratching the surface. Which is why in Proverbs chapter three, you wanna throw that up there, Proverbs three, Verses four and five and six. Uh, no, that's not it. Yeah, there we go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. There's, that's faith. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, he's not saying we shouldn't try to understand, but he's saying it is that there's always, as much as we know, there's always more we could know and there's things that we don't understand and we don't understand about what God is doing. And I like that word lean because that's the, that, that's the idea of, of faith. You are expressing faith this morning if you're sitting in a chair. You are leaning or sitting, you are resting your weight. And that's the, actually the essence of what faith is, is, is putting our weight down upon something. Now I had a, a buddy a few years ago I don't know if they're still doing it now in Las Vegas because they may, everything may be shut down. Um, but there's a casino and a resort there called the Stratosphere, and you may have heard of it. It's this big, tall tower, and they have thrill rides on, on the top of the, uh, of the Stratosphere. And one of the thrill rides, if you want to call it that, it seems crazy to me, is they have a thing where you can make a controlled jump off the Stratosphere. And he did it. I don't understand why anybody would jump out of a perfectly good plane or off of a perfectly good building. But he did. They hook you up to this harness, they put you in this suit, and you literally walk to the edge, and you look down however many hundred feet it is to the, to the street below, and you step off. And you're hooked to a cable that's, that lets out as you go down, and you start out in a free fall. Doesn't that sound like fun? As I said, I've struggled with fear all my life. But the idea is, as you get closer to the ground, the cable tightens up, and then you land, and you get down at the bottom, and you feel yourself to see if you're still in one piece, and you realize you are. And 
ultimately, there's, you, you get pretty excited. The adrenaline's pumping. But that is, a, that is a, 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 a courageous faith that I haven't attained yet, okay? But that's, that's the idea, that there is this willingness to step toward God, step toward what it is you're being called to, not, and it has nothing to do with the size of your faith. It has everything to do with the strength of the cable holding on to you. See, courageous faith allows us to face what we don't understand and the things that we fear because we know there's joy on the other side of it. And that's the joy we're talking about. It's not a joy that's contingent upon everything going perfectly in my life. Because if there's anybody in this room who's ever, if you're thinking everything's going perfect, I don't think there is. I don't think there's anybody here who thinks everything's going perfectly. Interesting passage in Hebrews chapter 12. Jesus, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, Looking to Jesus, talking about as we, in this whole idea of faith, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, ha, who for the what? Joy set before him endured the cross. That ought, to, that ought to just give you chills. For the joy set before him. The joy. And he wasn't anxious to do this, was he? Gethsemane? He said, Father, <laughs> if there's a plan B... I'm, I'm open. But, but for the joy set before him, he endured the most hideous, the most heinous crucifixion, cruel punishment ever devised by humankind. Why? Because of the joy that was set before him. And the joy that was set before him was the changed lives of people like you and me. It's why James in chapter 1, chapter 2, or verse 2 says, count it all joy. When you encounter wonderful times, no, when you encounter trials. Why? It's not because we were masochistic. It's because there is joy on the other side of the trial. And we have a God who is powerful enough to be at work in the midst of that. See, God not only knows what's ahead, but he's already there waiting for us to arrive when we step toward him. Okay, so God's power. But God's power is not indiscriminate. God doesn't just use his power indiscriminately. It's always in accord with a purpose or a plan. It's always in accord with a purpose or a plan. And here's his plan, verse 22. Verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He refers back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, another very famous Advent uh, verse that we often use. But here's the second key. The first key is God's power is greater than anything we could ever imagine. And we need to remember that. But the second thing is, is that God's plan is better than anything we could ever hope for. It's better than anything we could ever hope for. And it usually is not the plan that we thought we were going to do. Life doesn't usually turn out the way we think it's going to turn out. But that's okay. Because God has a better plan. He says that this is the way he was going to save the world. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah, is, is, there's a revelation to him about what the Messiah was going to look like, how he was going to arrive. And the first thing we notice is that he said he would, that a virgin will be with child. And I think specifically in this case, the, the virgin is... is uh, a, a woman who has never had intimate relationship. It clearly, it would be a miraculous birth. Well, we just saw that, didn't we? That's, that was the first part of the, the, the plan here. 
But the second part, he tells us, is that his name will be called Emmanuel. Or he shall be called Emmanuel, I should say, which means God with us. Now you say, why, why do we, is he named Jesus instead of Emmanuel? Well, first of all, because the text tells us that that's what he was to name the, the son, was Jesus, Yeshua, which is Hebrew, for salvation. God had a plan for our salvation. It was a man. His name was Jesus. So what is this Emmanuel stuff? Emmanuel is a descriptor of what the Messiah would do. He is God with us. He is God with us. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, in verse 14 of chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was with us. You see, Orthodox theology teaches us that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And every heresy that has come down through the ages has compromised somewhere on that string. He's either not really a man or he's not really God. No, he's both. He's really God and he's really man. And this passage reminds us of that. And God has a plan. God has a plan that is going to be better than anything we could ever hope for, which means that we can spend eternity with him. He's he's not just thinking about what's going on today, although he cares about that, but he's got a plan and he's been working on it for 700 years, or at least he had been working on it from eternity past. He had revealed it 700 years before. He's not like Indiana Jones. When asked, how are you gonna make this happen? And he says, I don't know, I'm making this up as I go, right? He's not that. He's got it planned. He knew, and he had a singular plan, and that singular plan was a man, Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Christ. And he is the one who would bring salvation. And the way he does that is he he comes to be with us. See, courageous faith rests on the bedrock that God isn't at a loss for what to do next. That uniquely singular solution to our sin sin problem is Jesus. He came to earth as a man who also happened to have a divine nature. He lived a life we couldn't live, sinless. He died on a cross to take my place and your place so that we wouldn't have to be separated from God and absolutely alone, separated from God for eternity. And then he rose from the dead and he sent his Holy Spirit. And that's why the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 13 of Hebrews says, I will never leave you, speaking of God, I will never leave you or forsake you. Think about that, is that a good plan? I will never leave you. You see, he's looking back at the book, in the book of Deuteronomy where God says to, to Joshua and to, before they take the land, be courageous, there's that word, and strong. For I am with you and I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Men and women, whatever the gift was, whatever gifts you received a few weeks back that were under the tree, nothing compares to the gift of eternal life that he offers if you would receive him into your heart. Open your life to him and receive him. God's plan is Jesus. Whatever your future, you will not have to face it alone. That's his promise. He's as near as the softest prayer and the loneliest cry for help. He is with us. God never promises to to remove all our trials from our life. Number one, because it would be counterproductive. (laughs) Trials are the things he uses in our life to make us more like Christ. What he promises is that he will be with us through whatever we're going to face. I love this picture. You want to throw that up there? The picture of 
Jesus with his arm around the guy. There's a painting of Jesus with his arm around a guy facing an uncertain future, an open ocean. I love that. Men and women, someday you and I are going to stand before the living God. We all are. And he's going to ask the question, why should I let you into my heaven? And before you can even open your mouth, Jesus' arm is going to be around you and is going to say, he's with me. He's with me. Men and women, God has a plan that's better than anything we could ever have hoped for. And that plan is very simply this, that God is going to save the world. Strange as it sounds, he is going to strange the, save the world by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, so that you never have to live and walk alone. Amen. He's going to be with you. He knows you. He knows everything about you. Even on your worst day, he knows you and he still loves you. He's still got his arm around you. Even on the day, I mean, he loves you just as much then as on the as. as as in, on your worst day as he does on the day you're really hitting on all cylinders for Jesus. That's what kind of God he is. That's what kind of plan he has. He isn't put off. He isn't turned off. And he isn't ticked off at you. Because of Jesus. That's his plan. God has a better plan than anything we could have ever hoped for. Anything. And you know what? I think Joseph got it. And you know how I know he, he got it? He jumped off the stratosphere. Verse 24, when, Jesus, or when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took it, Mary as his wife, but he knew her not until he had given birth both to a son, and he called his name Jesus. He got it. He stepped toward a painful, uncertain, unbelievably difficult circumstance. He knew his life as he had known it was never going to be the same again. But what we know, even though we don't know a lot about what happened to Joseph after this, he got this one right. And we are the beneficiaries of the joy that that act of faith Produced. God's power is greater than anything you could ever imagine. God's plan is better than anything you could ever hope for. And so what he's inviting us to do today is trust him. To really put our weight down and believe that that is true. And whatever our future, God's word can be trusted. It can be trusted. That doesn't mean it, you're gonna have, your problems are all going to go away. It might mean that your problems might just be starting. But he's going to walk with you through whatever it is that you're facing. Because even if you don't recognize that he's there, he's there. He's there. Stephen Kotler He's a journalist and an author. And he said this. He said, the road to joy is paved with courage. I would say the road to contagious joy is paved with courageous faith. About 13 years ago, I was at a crossroads in my life. I had pastored a church in the Phoenix area for 20 years, I was in my mid-50s, and I knew that I had gone as far as I could go. I had taken this church as far as I could take it, and I was at a midlife crisis point. I was at a point where I thought, okay, what's next? <laughs> what's next? I heard about a little church about 100 miles away in Prescott, Arizona, 
that was looking for a pastor. And I thought, oh, this would be great. I know Prescott. We've got a cabin up there. We could live up there. I knew people on the board. I could, I, I, as I looked at it, I thought, oh, God is lining this up perfectly. This is where I'm going to do my final chapter of vocational ministry is going to be in, in this situation. It must be what God had planned. It wasn't. They hired a 25-year-old young man. And I had 25 years of ministry at that point, And I thought, I'm done. <laughs> to say I was disappointed would be the same as saying the Titanic was a boating accident. I was devastated. I was crushed. I thought... <laughs> What did I do to deserve this? What I didn't know is that God had a better plan. An opportunity that I had no idea existed in Arlington, Texas opened up. I finished out my vocational ministry in there and that move saved my ministry. It It was a plan that was better than anything I could have ever hoped for. But I had to step toward uncertainty and fear and into that to see that. Men and women, courageous faith produces contagious joy. Because we believe that it's not my circumstances, but it's what's beyond my circumstances that is where that joy comes from. And when we begin to to see that and we begin to to realize, okay, this is what God is asking me to do. This is how he's asking me to step toward him. We don't have to go looking for joy. Joy will find us. Joy will find us. And that's how we rejoice in the midst of a weary world. Because this isn't going to last. This stuff we're in right now, COVID, politics, whatever it is you're going through personally, it's not going to last. But I do know that I know that I know that whatever is ahead, his arm is around me. And it's around you. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for this truth, this, that you love us in such a profound way that you will always be with us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. That you have a plan for our life that even though we can't see it, we don't understand it. You're there. Father, I pray for each of us today that we would lean into you in a fresh new way this morning. And that the fear that has dominated us, whatever it might be, that we might see it through your eyes today. And discover that contagious joy that you want us to experience. We thank you. Your love is that wonderful. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua, our Savior and our Lord.